Hello, everyone. So uh, welcome to the panel uh, session. Um, so we will have four of the speakers uh, joining us. Uh, in addition, we, will have, we are also very fortunate to have Tao Gao join us uh, this discussion. Um, Dr. Tao Gao uh, explored the visual roots of human social perception and cognition. Um, he builds models of artificial social intelligence with human-like visual common sense, which just by sharing the same visual environment uh, can cooperate, communicate uh, with humans in intuitive, effective, and trustworthy ways. Um, he obtained his PhD in cognitive psychology from Yale in 2011. Uh, he was a postdoc in the Center of Brain, Mind, and Machine at MIT between 2011 and uh, uh, 2015. Uh, he then worked at the GE Research as a computer vision scientist between 2015 and 2017. Uh, he has been jointly appointed uh, to the Department of Statistics, Communication, and Psychology at UCLA since 2017. Welcome. Um, okay, so I will stop sharing the screens and uh, so we can see the face of uh, our panelists. All right, so um, let's start from the first question. Um, so the first question is, uh, kind of echoes with some points brought up in the uh, talks. Um, it's about how we can uh, design um, optimization ob objectives of uh, models for so social uh, intelligence and how can we uh, design evaluation metrics for uh, models for uh, machine social intelligence. Um, so just as a very common example, um, a lot of talks mentioned uh, a reward re function that we can design to train agents and also to evaluate agents for various problems in social intelligence. Um, a recent paper from DeepMind even argues that reward is enough for virtually every aspect of AI and certainly including social intelligence. So do you think uh, this kind of um, uh, common optimization objective and evaluation metrics for uh, machine social intelligence are, ne are enough? Um, are they compatible? compatible with human social intelligence. Uh, are there any potential biases in, in such uh, objectives and uh, evaluations? Since I'm not the invited speaker, maybe I can say first. Um, yeah, I can. Go ahead. Um, so I can draw the first plot, maybe. Um, so um, I think reward is important. And uh, that's why I spend a lot of time actually studying uh, reinforced learning. And um, so, I certainly learn a lot from that, and I think it captures um, some very important aspect of uh, of our uh, even in social learning. Um, but I would be hesitant to say it will capture everything. Just everything we do as human um, can be captured by reward. Just something very simple. I think, especially when I spend a lot of time reading developmental literatures, if reward is everything, then nothing can stop monkeys or chimpanzees to use reinforced learning to do whatever we are doing now. But you know, we are here having a workshop, monkey stone. Um, so what's the reason? Uh, is that because we have a bigger neural network than them? Um, I highly doubt that. Um, so that's one reason uh, at the very top level. Um, at the more um, computational level, I would say, even we can see several talk here, the reward, what is the reward? Um, typically the, the promise of reinforced learning is typically that uh, many cases they say reinforced learning is great. Why is that great? Because rewards is easy to define. And then let's use a generic algorithm to handle that. So that has always, if you read the textbook for reinforced learning, that has always been part of the promise. Um, so that the, based on the task, we can easily design the reward and then a generic learning mechanism can handle that. But in many of the cases, especially in many of the social um, topic discussed here, it's not quite easy what is the reward. And many times the reward may be defined in terms of your relationship with others' mental state. And then if reward is not that easy to define, it requires a lot of insights in cognitive science. And then can we just say, should we say who, who is doing the heavy lifting? Is the reward learning doing the heavy lifting or the one who is discovering all the interesting reward doing the heavy lifting, right? So sometimes the argument is not about correct or, right or wrong, it's about whether it's useful, uh, whether it can be productive to lead to the next generation of, of, of approach. So the question is really here, which perspective is more productive? Should we just say, let's just figure out how to do reinforced learning and then hopefully um, when this mechanism is powerful enough, everything will naturally emerge. Or should we look more closely, look at the human social interaction and find out all the great insights 
And then eventually we say, well, to implement those insights, maybe we can use reinforced learning. That's one, that's the second answer. And then I would say the third answer is that, um, especially when I, when I read the, uh, some kind of lit, uh, evolutionary literature uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, animals and including human mind, I do feel there's a very interesting interaction between the cognitive mechanism and the motivation. So we can say motivation, we can formulate that as part of reward, something we really cares about. It seems like during evolution time, we do adapt our cognitive mechanism so that that particular motivation can be better satisfied. And uh, that means um, there's something special beyond the generic learning mechanism. For example, I, I spend a lot of time working on cooperation in communication. In communication theory, there's a lot of discussion of common ground about the transparency of the mind, um, about uh, you know, joint rationality principle. Those are all the specific cognitive mechanism or representation specifically designed to solve the challenge of cooperation. And should we just throw them all away and saying that a reinforced learning can capture all of them? Uh, I'm not sure about that. So that's my three, three reasons why I think re reward may not be everything. Well, maybe what I can do is to just piggyback on what Tao was just saying, <clears throat> because initially when Tao was saying, oh, maybe reward is uh, not sufficient, I was going to raise something that's maybe saying something against it. And then I was finding myself just nodding at what he's saying. And basically, I, I agree with what you're saying here. That said, I think the, the idea that human beings as well as machines are driven by, well, you, in order to motivate a behavior, you have to assign some reasons for doing so. And the fact that there's this intrinsic motivation that's allowing us to, to generate a behavior, I find that at least that basic assumption very compelling, but it becomes quickly very, very complicated when you think about, well, what kind of motivations? Because even from the very first talk today, Rebecca Sachs was talking about informational uh, motivations as well as social motivations. And uh, within social motivations, there's motivations to be approved, uh, motivations to be loved and care for others and help others. And the, uh, the ways in which we might uh, specify those are really unclear because the exact way you have to act really depends on the specifics of the context and what you understand about the situation. And there's also a sense in which, uh, as you said, Tao, just to again piggybacking up on what you were saying, there's a sense in which knowing something about the world and having a cognitive capacity, such as knowing, uh, representing others' minds, gives rise to specific motivations that give rise to particular behaviors. So for instance, some of our new work is showing that when children uh, fail to do something and someone observed it, and then before they finally succeed for the third time, this person leaves the room, then when this person comes back, they really wanna go ahead and show off, even going uh, foregoing an opportunity to teach another person something else, they really wanna show off and say, hey, look, you think I can't do it? I can't can do it. And what this means is that without the ability to represent what other people saw and why that might per, uh, why that person might think that I'm incapable of doing something and having the desire to revise that person's belief about me, you wouldn't have this kind of behavior. So this reputation management or the motivation to look good or present oneself in the eyes of others, uh, what this requires is the cognitive ability to represent other people's minds. So I think this again suggests something about why uh, we say we say motivation as if it's like one thing but it's actually much more complicated when you start applying it to uh, predict particular behaviors in particular uh, contexts and uh, just noting on the difficulty of benchmarks uh, for evaluating agents on these social interactions I find it really really difficult to even uh, understand where to start because for games or tasks with clear end goals, it's really easy to score uh, how well you did. But now, once you walk into the realm of human actions, even seemingly simple things like cleaning the room becomes really hard to evaluate because what does it mean to have a clean room? It depends on the person, depends on the initial state, and depends on how quickly you've done it or whether you needed tools or other kinds of things. 
And just think about the, uh, the subjectivity of what it means to have a good conversation or have a person whose uh, table manners are good. So a lot of these things become pretty tricky. So I'm really open to more thoughts from this audience and the group to hear thoughts on how do we even start thinking about these benchmarks for social agents? I'm late to the party. I'm sorry, I was at a doctor's appointment, but uh, I got paged in on what the question was, and it's one that I have strong opinions about, probably. Um, so my take would be that um, technically this, uh, this statement is almost correct, and I'll comment in a moment on almost is, right, technically, because it doesn't say um, that's the only way to do it. That's not to say that's how humans do it. Do we use intrinsic motivation and not as you, I don't know, we might, but the question is, can you do it with rewards, right? And so I think it, 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 you almost can do it, uh, and I'll explain that in a second, but of course I agree wholeheartedly with what was said before, that uh, <laughs> that's kind of a vacuous statement, because yes, I can do it with a reward, but what is that reward? I have no idea how to possibly define a reward that incentivizes all this stuff that you want for social intelligence. Oh my goodness. So, um, so yes, one could do it that way, but who cares? Because uh, it's, it's not easy to define. So in, in part, this is a, a question that's very kind of near and dear to my heart, because my lab has spent the past maybe four or five years obsessing about how we can possibly define engineer, help people define um, um, and learn reward functions, you know, and Dea here, that's, you know, that's her thesis and she's not the only one in my lab was working on that. Um, we're obsessed with this question because we've indeed noticed like many other people have that, that even for much, much less complex tasks than enabling robots to be socially intelligent, you know, for things, I, I think that was an example for just grasping, moving around people, whatever. Even for the autonomous cars, I spent one day a week at Waymo. Um, and, and so it's autonomous driving, like, good luck defining a good reward function for autonomous driving that incentivizes the right behavior absolutely everywhere. Um, so, so yeah, I, I, I completely agree that, that um, you know, in a sense, it, it's, it's, it is enough, but it isn't because, because the 90% of the problem at that point is what is this reward function. Now I said almost just because I wanted to clarify that I agree with this, you know, it, it, representations of beliefs of others are, of course, I believe that's very, very useful, but they don't have to be explicit, right? So I think if you just unleash an agent in a model three way and give it a reward and, you know, allow it sample complexity to doesn't matter and it can just do whatever and it can mess up as much as it wants or whatever. you know technically it could build implicit representations right this interesting motivation that we were talking about this uh, i love this example right of uh, uh, of uh, desire to look good, right? Desire to correct other people's beliefs about, no, 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 I know, I actually know that. Um, uh, but I think it probably can fall out of, <clears throat> out of you know, um, an overall objective. Like it, it's useful for me, for other people to think that I'm smart because you know, if they don't, then that has negative implications on my ability to get stuff done in a societal context. So I think that can all sort of fall out. I think the, the one challenge of, it's not just reward, it's, it's sort of how you formulate the problem as well. So um, you know, the model three RL way is to just kind of learn a policy that maps some limited history to action or distribution over action. Um, and the moment you're in a sort of a multi-agent setting, right, where there's, there's your sort of maybe in a game theoretic setting and so on, those techniques might not, might not apply. Even when you're in a partially observable setting, which when you interact with humans, clearly you are because you don't know their internal states, you don't know their beliefs and so on, um, that limited history might not be enough. And so it might be impossible to converge to the right policy if you just sort of apply a model-based, uh, a model-free RL technique and you don't pay attention to the problem formulation. You kind of need to say, you know, it's a, what is it, a partial observable stochastic game? Is it a deck palm DP? Like, well, what, what why are we operating in? And then tailor the algorithm to that. So I don't think it's as easy as it's reward in a single agent problem you know, and it will, even if, though that's technically not true, it will just figure it out. So I, that was the, the small caveat. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> Thanks for allowing me to rant on this. So I guess it's my turn to rant and I'll give a slightly different rant than Anka's, um, although I agree with hers. Um, I, I think a, a large part of this confusion comes back to 
what's maybe a fundamental question that we often kind of skirt past, which is what is our actual goal in building these systems? Um, so if you're trying to just build a useful system, you know, you really want to build a, a system that can clean a room and gosh, that would be great. But as a roboticist, I think that's probably the hardest task I've heard so far today. Um, I, I think that you could, you know, shape a good reward function and it might be really hard, but is it, you know, is it theoretically possible for me to do it? Yeah, almost certainly. Um, if your goal is to model human behavior, then I think you have to go back a little bit and say, well, are, are we actually building correct models here? You know, uh, all of our models are built on a certain level of abstraction in which we have this wonderful, you know, digital computing metaphor that we're using to, in some ways, estimate what we think is going on in the human. And whether or not we have that at the right level of abstraction or not, the idea that we could sum things up as this single reward function is really hard to swallow at that point. Um, you know, that I can somehow get down to something, some nice little function that produces a, a single real valued number that represents everything that's going on within the human and all decision-making capabilities that they have. Well, I think we've got good data that actually says that's not going to work. I mean, we know people are irrational. We know people who make decisions for realize for reasons that they don't have good conscious awareness of. We know that people make decisions that are at times counter to the things that they've said previously and even the decisions that they've made previously. So at some point, if, you're, if your goal here is to do good modeling of human behavior, I think you're gonna have to abandon this idea that reward is everything very, very quickly. If your goal is to build good, usable, uh, workable robots or systems, then probably you can skate by with it for a while longer. And I think then it goes to Tao's question of just, is this a useful way to do things? Um, and right now, maybe it is, but probably, you know, we're going to get to tasks in the very near future, like Anka's driving example, that it's just too complex. We can't easily use this and we need some other tool or technique. Okay, my rant's done. So that, that proved to be an excellent first discussion question. Thanks so much, everybody. Um, so I'm gonna ask the next question. So this is um, for everybody, but maybe in particular to the panelists on the cognitive science developmental psychology side. Um, what do you think studying infants and young children tells us about the origins of social intelligence? And what does it not tell us? Like, are there kind of misconceptions about why people study kids and babies that you might think you'd like to comment on, especially given this um, diverse audience? And why are you personally interested in studying this, this population? Um, so that's, that's the question. Kylie, do you want to take that first? Or happy to go for Go ahead, please, yeah. Uh, sure. Well, so so what does it tell us and what does it not tell us? I think Kylie is going to have a lot to say about uh, um, what it tells us about the origins of social intelligence. Precisely, that's what her talk was about. And she studies incredibly young infants here. So for me, I'm coming from a side of uh, studying somewhat younger children with uh, uh, some assumptions about what kinds of processes are underlying their inferences, what might be the representations that uh, they're already capable of uh, having or representing. So they already have an understanding of these are agents, they recognize them, these are objects, they recognize those objects, they understand the causal relationship between agents' actions as well as uh, 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 their relationship between agents and uh, objects, and they understand agents' actions as actions that are um, driven to make changes in the world, either on the physical states of the world or in, even in mental states of other people. So I think what uh, my work is showing, and perhaps it's useful to maybe start from what uh, a lot of our work is not showing, which is 
a lot of the studies that I think developmental psychologists do and in cognitive science more generally, we've been focusing a lot on uh, the inferences and representations and focusing less on the actual outputs of these inferences. So what are the behaviors that children or uh, infants generate and what kind of things do they end up doing that turns into some kind of actual change in the states of the world and uh, the consequences of what they do. And this becomes incredibly clear when you think about the implications of cognitive science and developmental psychology in robotics, because it's just like what Anka said, even the simplest grasping actions turns out to be incredibly, incredibly difficult. And we know relatively more about what's going on inside our minds and what's happening inside our, uh, our brains, but we still don't know as much about how this translates into real world actions. So one of the things that I like to think about in terms of designing my studies and thinking about what children do is that even though some of my studies are choices, still these choices end up having some kind of impact on the world. You communicate something or you show something, you choose what to teach, or these are behaviors that end up uh, do, having some exploration on the toys or you squeeze this toy to see if it works. So what I would like to see more uh, from this side of the field is uh, taking a more focus on or putting more focus on uh, not just representations and inferences and everything ends there, but how does it actually translate to real world actions? And that's what I would love to see. And I think that will also help us bridge these fields together all the way from machine learning to robotics and having more better uh, robots that can actually move around and help people too. That was my rant again. <laughs> Great. Um, yeah, I I agree with what Hyo said. My my own um, interest is really in the you know what is what can, is there you know some starting state right? Um, as I sort of opening open the the framing of my talk, um, and you know that leads to a lot of um, heated discussions about nature and nurture debates and, um, you know, isn't it possible that um, babies in their first, you know, inside the womb somehow have experience that leads them to um, produce the relatively marked behaviors we're seeing them produce a few moments after they're born? Um, or isn't it possible for example, in the case of my work, that in the first three months they have sufficient experiences with um, seeing or experiencing being helped, for example, that leads them to build the um, models that then lead them to produce the behaviors they do um, that we observe in say three month olds. And I think that um, that is a um, like absolutely the right kind of question to be asking, of course. Um, my my own assumption is that if infants have the kind of experiences in the womb or in the first three months of age that they are then able to build the kind of what i do believe are rich models of uh the social mind sufficiently that suggests to me at least that the learning process is um incredibly sophisticated <laughs> um so that it doesn't seem like they're taking, um, you know, thousands of instances of data of, um, say, being harmed um, in order to plug in to uh, build these models. Maybe they're taking um, a few. <laughs> um, and so to me, that suggests that the learning process is um, guided by something. Um, and so to me, that just suggests that, again, we're back to the starting state and what it, and what is that? Um, and so, yeah, uh, so I don't, I don't think what babies are doing in their first three months um, is building up um, hundreds of thousands of instances of behave, of data in the way that you might um, throw at a, a sort of model free robotic system. Um, and and try to get it to produce the kinds of inferences that we're seeing babies producing that quickly. Like I, I, I personally don't believe that they're having that enough experience for it to be in a sort of model free kind of way. Um, I have some 
um, uh, comments on that. So first of all, I just say, claim I'm not developmental psychologist. So, but I was there when Kelly presented her work, when Kelly's work got published by Nature. So I think that actually inspires me doing what I'm doing today. So even uh, I'm not a developmental psychologist. And by the way, I, I learned AI from Scott in Scott's AI class. So, uh, so I, very good to see both of them here. So I can, um, so I think I do feel, I, I from, I'm trying to think from an AI perspective and I would say, I do feel I personally learned so much from uh, developmental psychology. I think one thing um, I learned is that you can do so much without language. That's one thing I learned from uh, all the infant study and all the toddler study. Because in the past, when I was an undergraduate studying psychology many years ago, there's always the question, what is uniquely human? What makes us so special? And then the answer always, you push it back to language. The reason we are so special because we can, we can use language. Others don't have language. And then the question is, what is language? And you may study Chomsky, you may study grammar, but it's really not that satisfying, right? But now with all this, awesome developmental literature you can read, you can find so much about what is uniquely human from those very young baby or toddlers who before they become a master of language. That basically tells you there's so many things you can work on to reveal the true nature of human intelligence without worrying about language. And then there's, and then especially without language, it's all just based on visual scene. So we can say the current wave of AI is largely driven by computer vision, a large part of it driven by computer vision. So if you are very good vision people, who really want to understand how we represent the visual scene, then think about all the crazy tasks that young, young infants or children can do just by looking at the scene, right? There are so many things you can work on beyond improving your face detection accuracy by another 1% uh, or 1.1%. 1. 1. And so that's one part. And then the other part is that perhaps now we, can, we do have a, some answer about why we can use language because we don't use language in the natural language processing way, just, you know, mining a corpus of the data. We learn language in the contact we receive, we share the visual environment. There's so many rich inference going on and so many common sense understanding going on. In that contact, we grab that, you know, when I say a word, when I say a new sentence, you may understand what I, what I actually mean. So I think this is really, uh, this is really awesome. I can, I can clearly, clearly see so many things can be done. Uh, just uh, um, looking at, just inspired by all the crazy things young children can do. Yeah, that's my comment. So I'll, I'll chime in also and say, um, while I'm not currently a developmental psychologist, I once was and I once wore that hat. And um, I think it very much colors my uh, approach to things today. Um, social behavior is just so rich and deep and interesting and looking at it developmentally gives us one avenue, um, one way in which we can uncover something about human social behavior. But one of the really unique things about when everyone who studies social behavior is very interdisciplinary from the start. We take models from typical development. Um, we take models from atypical development. We take models from evolutionary evidence about social development. We take cultural anthropology models from about social development. And we take neurophysiological models about social development. And we put all of these things together. And what's one of the wonderful things is that now we're starting to see computational models also being influential in that, in the way that everyone thinks about these systems. Um, so no single one of these uh, techniques is really everything. Um, from a developmental point of view, we'd love to do the equivalent of, you know, ablation studies or, you know, basically to say, what would happen if I stopped this in development? But you don't get to do that with kids. Like that's unethical and unreasonable and completely impossible for us to do. We can totally do it with a computational model though. Um, with cultural anthropology, with primatology, we see different types of social behavior that gets expressed. And we'd often like to go back and say, you know, could we actually go and modify the way that this changed? Or what would happen? What would evolve if we made these modifications? But we don't get that kind of evidence from that sort of model. So um, I think if you're, you know, going to be, uh, uh, you know, serious about being in this world and pursuing this world, 
you somewhat have to have a, a multiple set of hats that you can wear, or at least be willing to dive into the literature that crosses a lot of boundaries. Um, and uh, I think that's one of my favorite things about these kinds of meetings when you get together people with lots of different backgrounds is you really get very different perspectives. I learned a lot today, stuff that I didn't know. And, um, and I think that happens every time we get groups like this together. I'm also very upset that this is virtual because I would really love to sit down and chat with pretty much all of these panelists, some of us to catch up and some of us to, to get to know each other. So um, next time uh, we'll have to do this again. Uh, any other thoughts? Okay, so um, let's move on to the next question, uh, which is actually a follow up question uh, successfully predicted by one, one, one of our audience, uh, Ben Cindy. Um, so uh, looking at how humans develop our own social intelligence, um, can you envision a ro roadmap for building social intelligence uh, robots? Are there uh, you know, some kind of fundamental problems we have to solve first? Are there some uh, you know, knowledge and concepts and skills we should build in as priors? Are there some additional concepts and skills we should learn from experience? And specifically, what kinds of experience? I can, I can say a roadmap. It's not my roadmap. It's, it's, a, it's Michael Tomasello's roadmap. So I, will, I shouldn't really be the one to get the credit. And, and I'm not necessarily saying that um, it, is the, it, is, it is the right one, because you know, I know that um, you know, it's actually very heatedly debated in uh, several of his argument. But I think his, his roadmap is three stages. The first stage is, is um, roughly speaking, because I'm, I'm getting nervous because Kelly and, uh, and, and there are other very expert development psychologists here, so now I'm getting nervous about getting to my uh, But the rough idea is that uh, uh, from zero to 12 months old, you, you have a, this he called the individual intentionality stage where you understand others' intention, uh, all the kind of good sort of mind work um, um, we have seen uh, in the last uh, decades. Um, but it's most like from an observing, observer's perspective, you are evaluating, you're observing. And then that also mimics that he, he argued that largely shared with chimpanzee about 6 million years ago. So that's basically what we shared with other, with other animals. Um, and then he said uh, from about roughly from 12 months old, maybe 15 months old, you move to the second stage. He called the shared intentionality, where it's really about doing things together. Uh, common mind, common ground. It's not just your mind and my mind, less what we know together, what we want together. It's a joint attention. There's actually a very good talk about the joint attention uh, in, in the spotlight talk. And then from that, you can have all the uh, interpersonal collaboration, you know, you know, shared visual environment. That's actually very much uh, aligned with all the robotics interest. Uh, you stay in the same environment, you are working with a collaborator, you want to do something together. And then from that, when you have all this common mind, then you also need some kind of communication, also largely based on vision, visually based communication, pointing, pantomiming, so you can synchronize in your mind. Um, so that's the second stage. I think uh, my student, Stephanie, uh, she basically present, presented some of the work along that line of thinking. I think I'm, I'm currently in that stage. And then she said, is that there's a third stage that's the more like when you become six, six years old, you become reasonable. I can teach you. That's why people put you into school when you become six, because at that point, I can win an argument with you, not because I'm physically stronger, but you would agree that I have a better argument. Um, and then at that point, you have fully developed the language and you have, you know, the cultural norms, convention, um, all the under understanding social institute, like the workshop we are doing here now is a social institute. So that's the third stage. So that is his uh, roadmap. Um, and uh, I'm not saying that I completely agree with him, but having a roadmap is better than not having one. So I feel, uh, I think the reason I'm doing some, what I'm doing is really in influenced by him because I feel the, the first stage, the, the, the seal of mind, you understand what I'm doing. There's already very good, very good work. And so that's why I want to push some of the modern work. Uh, as a cognitive scientist, I really feel I shouldn't be the one who's doing all the cool, awesome engineering. I should really move the model a little bit forward. So that's why I'm focusing on the second stage on the shared intentionality stage. So that's the, that's the roadmap I learned from developmental psychology. 
just to add on to what Tao was saying, I guess I'm just, uh, again, uh, just piggyback on, piggybacking on what he's saying. I completely agree with you on the importance of shared intentionality. And there's these sort of uh, different, uh, not stages in a strict sense, but at least uh, there's this trajectory that seems to be becoming more, more and more sophisticated. One thing that I still grapple with is, is there a sense in which we can identify the absolute minimum thing that we have to build in? And then when you let the agent lose in the environment, everything else is going to kind of emerge. Or is there a sense in which all of these stages or all of these sort of um, uh, developmental milestones or trajectories have to be sort of scaffolded or built in in some kind of way? And I think that's maybe one question that I don't know exactly how to answer, but I think this is exactly where uh, studies with incredibly young infants can be really illuminating because it allows us to say, these are some of the things that they're capable of doing even incredibly early on, but somehow with experience and even though we tend to speak about, uh, talk about infants as, oh, they know so much and they learn so much, but it is still true that it takes a few years of experience for them to become like a child who's capable of telling you things and explaining things as well. So uh, I don't think we should be taking that developmental period and the period of learning so lightly, but just thinking about whether, uh, like how we should be thinking about uh, the developmental trajectory here is this, if we build in something that's core and minimum, and if you figure that out, do we actually have solved the problem here? Or do we still have to figure out exactly how to specify what is going on in each one of these stages? And I still find that question difficult to answer. So I'll jump in again. I, I used to believe that there was a good roadmap that we could follow. Um, uh, my PhD thesis in 2001 used Baron Cohen's mind blindness uh, model and we implemented that on a humanoid and it was great and it was awesome and we learned a few things about the way that that model works, but it was clearly not enough. And it wasn't that we implemented that and then suddenly, you know, as Kyo said, that it, it just took off by itself from that point on. And I think the, uh, while I still today desperately want there to be a roadmap, I think we're still uncovering so many very basic principles that I don't think anyone has a good roadmap right now. Um, and some of that is actually coming from the fact that we are finding ways to build things and, and to actually implement things. And we're learning something about human behavior in the process. Um, you know, 10 years ago, I didn't think about the way we introduce a system to people as being critically important for its social agency. Or I didn't think about, you know, how we could actually trigger things to go from agentic to non-agentic and why that was actually such an unusual thing to happen. Um, and so I, I, I wish there were a good roadmap um, and I'm hopeful that one of you will be really super smart and find one, but I think that um, we have a bit of work to do before we get there. Yeah, I um... I, over the years, you know, people say, well, you're a developmental psychologist, like, you know, exactly when this thing develops and, you know, before it develops, it's not there and then it develops and then it is there. And of late, my response is like, the field has changed, you know, turned everything on its head 20 times in the, what I feel like is a relatively short career as a developmental psychologist, you know, and I, I find myself saying, well, back when I was an RA in a lab, everyone thought this, and my students are like, oh, 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 you know, and like, it doesn't feel like that long ago to me. Um, and uh, I think, you know, that leads me to be skeptical of some of the, these models that act like, you know, this is when something happens before this, there's no, there's no evidence for this babies or kids having this kind of knowledge and after it, there's some kind of revolution happening at this age or that age, you know, I think that the evidence is suggesting that those kinds of revolutions are less uh, common and are less uh, significant shifts than we might have thought that they might be shifts in other systems that facilitate showing a particular um, skill within the system that you're studying. Um, 
And so, so anyway, yeah, I'm just, I'm agreeing with, uh, with Brian in terms of like, it's really hard to have a model when you, you, you feel like your own field is just so actually unsure of what the truth is. I mean, it's incredibly exciting time to be in the field and I assume it will remain an exciting field because our, our knowledge will change so much, but yeah, it's, it's hard to give you an exact model and say, this is, this is what to build in. <laughs> I also don't have any kind of roadmap to propose, but I, I can say one thing that I don't think will work, which is the engineer reward function and then unleash an agent onto the world and <laughs> watch it become socially intelligent. Um, uh, and this is a controversial statement, actually. I mean, I think, I think more and more we're seeing the, you know, the success of, of that method for a number of, of tasks that are maybe more complex than, you know, so, so that we could have maybe said the same thing for two years ago or five years ago. And so, so I think it's, a, it is a controversial state, not in this, probably not in this workshop, it's not a controversial statement, but outside of this workshop, like if you go to NeurIPS or ICML or iClear, it's a controversial statement. Um, but um, yeah, I think, I think the, the struggle for me is how do we, clearly the, the opposite approach of let's build out these skills and put them together and that will be it is not going to pan out either. And so how do you, how do you put in the sort of the inductive bias needed to essentially reduce sample complexity enough and, and sort of get the ball rolling enough, but still have the flexibility, you know, that should be a prior in a sense and, 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 and then be able to build upon that and have the flexibility to, to um, uh, adapt and, and learn, um, you know, uh, uh, Skaz said this very well that that for instance a lot of stuff that we tend to do is based on human modeling that uh, assume people are either rational or approximately rational or rational with a few cognitive biases that we're aware of stuff like that right and and it seems like if you don't put in anything about people and you just let let it loose um that um, you you have big problems. Like we've tried that, <laughs> we've tried and we keep trying it just to make sure that it still doesn't work. But <laughs> big problems. Um, at the same time, yeah, what what's a good good way to to use these kind of cognitive priors as priors? Um, I know Tom Griffiths is doing some work in that. Some folks in my lab are doing some work in that. And I'm sure I'm leaving out a lot of other folks um, who are working in this area. But but it, it, we, I don't think that anyone really knows an answer. Um, uh, this interesting motivation stuff, the representing other agents' beliefs and all that. We know that those things are important. And so it seems like making them explicit is useful, but how do you make them explicit in a way that still, you know, still enables the representation to evolve afterwards as opposed to having it set in stone? I don't think we quite know how to do that yet. I'll just quickly add one thing to what Anka was just saying. I completely agree. And even in a world where we do figure out exactly the right kinds of inductive biases to build in and let it loose, it still won't be like an actual human being uh, because unless other people treat it like a human being. So I think we've been talking about the actual learner uh, and what, what we should be building into the learner. But unless other people are talking to it, gazing towards it, and interacting with it in much the same way that we interact with a human infant and then a child, and of course, parental behaviors and other people's behaviors are changing a lot along with, there's a question about a hardware development. As a person grows up, we interact with them differently. As the person's mind grows up, we interact we interact with them differently, we use different levels of language. So I feel like even though we have the right learner, unless we put it in the right kind of environment, we won't be able to have the actual outcome of that learning process to be actually matching human behavior. So that's another thing I wanted to point out, uh, just based on uh, what I'm interested in, what we have been doing in, in, the, in light of social learning. Um, can I quickly add on Kelly's uh, comments? So, so Kelly just mentioned the field has been turning 20 times probably in a very short period of time. So I would say even in that case, um, the thing we can learn from the advanced psychology probably even more than Kelly has realized because in, in many cases, especially if, if I drop my cognitive science scientist identity, just say I'm building systems, we just sometimes the question being asked is probably more important than the answer. So in developmental psychology, there may be a very big deal. Could you recognize failed goal nine months or six months, that maybe changes all the theory. But from if you want to build intelligent machine, you only need to know there's a question you have, you need to build machine can recognize human failure. And then we build that 
And then we can leave the debate to developmental psychology to figure out whether it's nine months or 12 months. So I, I do think the question being asked that, you know, all the different representation being proposed is very, I think it's very, very helpful, probably even more important than the, the exact answer offered by the field. I'll just add on to that, and, and both Kylie you know, reminded me of this, but why are all of our social models so much about just the individual and have almost nothing to say about the rest of the society, and the rest of the group? Um, we know that parents spend so much time and energy and effort tailoring environments to the child's capabilities, but we never model that in computational systems. Well, almost never. Um, uh, Benji Rossman and, and Brad Hayes have a little bit of stuff on this, but, but we're still at the very primitive stage of dealing with this model. You know, we're, we're missing out on some huge big, big pieces that we recognize on the human side, but we still have no concept how to deal with it on the computational side. That was a great discussion. Um, so we're almost out of time, but there's a question in the chat that I feel like is a nice question to end on. Um, so here's the question. So many panelists here have either been deeply inspired by or directly collaborated with people from other fields. Um, what have been the most kind of fun parts of those collaborations? If, there's, or if there have been like difficult or kind of unsatisfying things, that would also be interesting to, to talk about. And then in general, like what do you think is a healthy and productive model for establishing interdisciplinary collaboration in communities? In other words, how do we get from this workshop to new scientific work? I'll start with a really practical thing, um, which is that different fields have very different ideas of what publication should look like and what success looks like. And the difference between our computer science world where you're a good grad student, you better be putting out two high quality conference papers a year to a developmental audience where one good paper every other year is really kind of your goal you know, one, you know, you get a PNAS or a, you know, a, a child development paper out every other year, you're fine. And, and just the difference in timelines and the difference in expectations of what goes into a single publication can be a real stumbling point. Um, you know, I've had a lot of collaborations with folks in medicine and folks in developmental psychology. And this is just one of the things that it's really hard to find a good solution for, um, you know, we need to publish every six months. And yet that basically, once something is published, a high-end journal won't take it in the developmental world once that data has been put out there. So uh, th there are some really just practical, you know, nuts and bolts type things that make this difficult to do. Um, I don't have a good suggestion for solving it other than you got to be really very clear about what your needs are. And a project has to be, you know, valuable and useful to both sides of the team, uh, or every side of the team. Otherwise, it's it's just not going to last. I can also speak to uh, maybe somewhat of a practical thing. One difficulty uh, with these collaborations is that, as fun as it is, oftentimes there's it's not easy to find students who are incredibly excited to learn about development and also has the technical uh, uh, toolkits and technical chops to actually carry out the modeling side or machine learning side of the work. So what I'm hoping is that these kinds of workshops will inspire current students to be interested in both sides of the game and try to be experts on both sides of the game and, and try to make really uh, bridges that can bring the fields together because a lot of the uh, ideas that we're talking about here, it won't be able to actually make any progress without uh, students and people who are really driving the work forward and having people who are excited about both and have the expertise and knowledge about both sides of the field. I think that's one important thing I wanted to point out. Uh, one uh, thing I've learned from collaborating and talking to people who are within the computer vision machine learning community uh, also robotics is uh, 
realizing how difficult it is, the kinds of things. So I teach undergrads about developmental psychology and I tell them, don't take for granted what you do because it's incredibly hard if you think about how we are developing these kinds of skills and learning those things. But it's a different kind of story when the things I take for granted uh, are incredibly hard to implement when you try to think about agents who are actually doing this uh, from a machine learning perspective, and even especially in robotics, when you uh, actually get to the stages of carrying out an action. So understanding what is difficult uh, across different fields, I think, is also something that takes a lot of learning and talking and co uh, conversations. So I wanted to uh, point that out on top of what Brian was saying. Um, I can share some of my experience. I think one of the challenging things is that it seems like there's two mindsets. One is the scientific mindset, the other is the engineering mindset. And do this kind of collaborative project is just very difficult how you switch between these two mindsets. Um, because uh, many of the engineering work you really care, you want to you want to converge, you want to come how come the measurement data side and then performance. That's what it takes. But then doing this kind of disciplinary work sometimes requires you asking the right scientific question that requires you to diverge and be open minded and and searching around to find the right topic. I just I think you know anyone who is I'm pretty sure many of the, most of the speaker here they are very successful at actually managing or sh shifting between these two mindsets. But I personally find it sometimes even uh, it's difficult to know in which stage of the project which mindset you should use. So I think that 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 is one of the challenge to do this kind of. Uh, um, interdisciplinary work. Um, so another challenge I, I would say, if you like developmental psychology very, very well, then that's good. But I think that's my personal experience. Actually, uh, developmental psychology is a field with its own debate. So if you talk to another developmental psychologist, it's really depending on who you are talking to, they may, they may hate you because you say something. So I actually have that experience before. So I would say, even for, for me, like as I said, I just really learn from the field. I just, I'm really, I'm advocating the field, but sometimes I get trouble um, to actually talk to some of the um, people in the field because uh, the, uh, they, may, they may feel that you don't share exactly their perspective. But as I said, you know, from, from people like me who are doing interdisciplinary work, I don't really care too much about the eternal debate. I think the debate is a very healthy thing. But if you talk to someone who is deeply invested in that field and don't care anything else, sometimes you get into trouble. Um, so be careful. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Um, That's hilarious. Now and uh, and funny to know that that is a, a perception shared by people outside of our field and not just us. I just assume every field is this uh, is this contentious, but uh, Sounds like maybe not. Uh, there are all, all, all the fields that are, are, are <laughs> I think this generally applies to any field. And what I'm saying is from an interdisciplinary perspective, when you say, oh, I really like your field, and then you want to have a conversation, you may actually run, run into a trouble because the, the, the theory you are advocating in that field may, be, may not be that person's uh, position. So they actually hate you for that. <laughs> so uh, we're just the... Uh, uh, we need to be a little bit diplomatic. That's what uh, my, based on my own personal experience. All right, so um, uh, I think we're out of time. Thanks so much to the panelists for this um, wonderful uh, discussion. Um,